Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I've had the privilege actually of investing in this area of the market for over 25 years now, and it's been a really dramatic and exciting ride. Um, I've met many of the iconic leaders of today's technology and disruptive businesses, but I feel that we're only really at the beginning of what's going to be happening. Um, and I didn't know until I came here today that there was a, a Bond theme um, to the morning, but um, I guess that, yes, this is the section where Bond sets off on his mission, but before, before heading off, he goes to visit Q to decide uh, what the latest gadgets are that he can use uh, in, in, in the quest of fulfilling what he's required to do. Um, oh, so broadly speaking, we're going to cover the artificial intelligence opportunity. What is AI? Why is it so disruptive? Um, how it's driving an automation process? Um, and what we see in terms of the future being now. I'm going to ask a question first, actually, I'm a little poll. So how many people use um, uh, an automated assistant like Siri um, or Alexa? So I reckon that's about 20% probably, 20%. How many people have a smartphone? Okay, that's pretty much everyone. So if I go back 10, even 12, 10, 12 years, uh, and I ask the smartphone question, I would have had the same number of hands up as we just had up for the automated assistant. So it's important to remember that things change rapidly, and some of the things that we'll talk about, you might think, well, that's never going to happen. Um, but actually, many of these things do. So the, here are a few stats about what we're expecting artificial intelligence to deliver. So we're expecting 8 billion AI-powered voice assistants by 2023. That puts it on a par with one per, per member of the population. Global GDP will increase by as much as $15.7 trillion, trillion dollars, driven by the AI opportunity. Robots could replace 30% of human jobs. Um, and already in 2021, 75% of companies are using AI in their businesses. AI is not as new as we perhaps think. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some of those stats translated into job types. Um, so 68% of jewellery um, being manufactured probably by robots. 97% of farming done by machines, replacing 99% of insurance underwriters. I deliberately left off the stat for wealth management. <laughs> So what is artificial intelligence? Well, it's been around for a long time. You know, even things like spell check in, uh, in, in producing mail is a form of artificial intelligence at its lowest level. So the first kind of wrapper, the broadest wrapper of what we call on this slide artificial intelligence is essentially rules-based. It's the way in which we define a series of rules to define a series of outcomes. So if this, then that. So for example, in trying to identify a cat for a machine, it could be... If, if this has two pointed triangles on top of a circle with a wiggly bit at the back, that might be a cat. That's kind of basic artificial intelligence. But as we move forward now with the speed at which this can be done, we move into a machine learning environment where we can actually supply the machine with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of images of a cat from which it can start to deduce some of that logic for itself through ultimately to what we call neural networks, which is where the network of artificial intelligence is actually linked up in a very similar way to the way that the brain is linked with a series of nodes. And that allows for uh, intelligence that doesn't necessarily require human intervention. So this is the path that we're on. Uh, and we're well through the first two and well into the third of these. Um, but what's really important here is that it's not just a very discrete area on its own. It depends on a huge amount of things around it. Data, for example. So it's not dissimilar to my mind uh, uh, in a way that artificial intelligence is like the tractor or the commercial truck um, of yesterday, but it still needs the oil on which to run. And therefore, without data, artif artificial intelligence really is nothing. So it's this universe of opportunity that we need to look at more broadly than artificial intelligence just on its own. So I've chosen to reflect this with what we call IoT, the Internet of Things. So we've been through a series of iterations of connectivity over the last 50 years, from mainframes 
to desktop computers to smartphones. And now we're moving into an era of the connectivity of everything, uh, from our fridges to tractors to our smartphones to our cars. And that connectivity allows for a huge amount of data to be generated, which can then be used in an artificially intelligent fashion to drive outputs. So there's a number here on the right-hand side that has been produced by McKinsey, suggesting that we could add between 5.5 and $12.6 trillion of uh, economic value from the use of artificial intelligence through this connectivity. And if you look at the way that's spread, you can see that some of the biggest areas are down at the bottom there. Human health, as much as $1.8 trillion of added value, could be a way to resolve some of the um, healthcare budget problems that almost every country struggles with. Factory automation, $1.4 to $3.2 trillion. So what we're seeing in a way um, moving forward is the idea that um, this uh, technology and artificial intelligence perhaps moves into areas of the world that have not been perhaps impacted so much to date, things like healthcare and industrials. Now, why is it that this is so powerful? And I think it's worth just taking a step back and giving a, a, a very quick three-slide lesson on this. So the thing about artificial intelligence uh, and anything computational and digital is that it grows at an exponential or a geometric rate. So on this slide, you can see on the right-hand side the millions of instructions per second on a transistor and how that has gone up 300 times in the last 20 years. On the left-hand side, we see the evolution of the energy density in a battery, which has gone up just four times in 20 years, probably slightly quicker than the pace of pension reform, judging by what I was listening to previously. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that um, there are two key laws that, that are in effect in digital technology. The first is Moore's law, which says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles every two years or that the cost halves every two years. So that creates a geometric progression. So you can see here uh, the cost of compute and the cost of storage. And let me just touch the cost of storage. That has fallen from 1990. You paid $569 for a gigabyte of storage. Now you pay less than two cents. So there are some things that could not happen 20 years ago. When we had the dot-com boom bust, we couldn't have had smartphones. The internet was there. A lot of the building blocks were in place for what we see today. But it couldn't happen because Moore's law hadn't progressed far enough to allow the speed and cost that we need for some of the trends we see today. Once we had that, once everything was cost effective and we could actually put a smartphone in our hands, which happened in 2007, then this next law, Metcalfe's law, was able to take effect. And Metcalfe's law says that the usefulness of a network expands exponentially with every new user. So when you have five nodes in the network, you can connect it 10 ways. When you have 10, it's 45 ways, and so it goes on. Um, and you can calculate any number. It's n times n minus 1 divided by 2 if you want to work out the, the connectivity of a particular network. So when you get up to sort of Facebook size, billions of users, you have a network which is super powerful. Um, but none of that was possible until we had connectivity, until we had smartphones. And this is why it's only happened in the last 10 years. It's why we've seen this huge surge in the evolution of companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon um, from almost nowhere to being the leading companies in the world. When you put those two laws together, you get this intrinsic value explosion. Um, the opportunity becomes almost endless. So I mentioned briefly earlier on the way in which we go through these waves, and I've put the four waves here on this slide. So we had um, the mainframe era, followed by the client-server era. That topped out with about 400 million desktop PCs being connected, wired connected, uh, around the world, then into the smartphone era, and now, of course, into this, what we call digital 4.0, the era of artificial intelligence, uh, of the connectivity of everything, and then the proliferation of data. So as speed has accelerated and cost has come down, it's possible to compute far more quickly, and it means that artificial intelligence can start to really challenge human intelligence. So this slide here is the results, year by year, of a competition uh, run by uh, an outfit called ImageNet in Asia, uh, and it shows you the error rate, human versus machine, of spotting a static image. And if we go back just 10 years to 2010, 
the machine was getting 28% error rate. Not really an acceptable level for performing many tasks that we might look to have machines perform. But even just five years later, it was on a par with the human at 5%. And now, whilst the human probably still languishes at around 5%, the machine is at 1.3%. So we're in a situation where suddenly machines can do a lot more of the tasks that humans have been doing, and hence that very first slide showing some of the way in which we can see disruption moving further up the curve in terms of intelligence. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we would have talked about replacing uh, various admin roles, clerical roles with word processors. Now we can talk about replacing farm laborers with machines, for example. This leads to um, you know, significant potential job loss, and that carries with it a lot of uh, social responsibility uh, and issues, um, which is you know, always open for debate. But McKinsey, again, forecasts as many as 400 million jobs will be lost by 2030 to automation and to the use of robotics uh, and artificial intelligence. And that, of course, drives a really important um, dynamic in terms of uh, investment in terms of what companies one invests in, in, in an equity sense. Um, I always say to people when they talk about, you know, how do we go about trying to outperform an index with our equity selection? And I say, in this particular part of the market, you make as much money by making sure you don't invest in the losers as you do by trying to find the winners, because the dispersion between winners and losers is so enormous. Um, the CEO of Microsoft has made it very clear that companies that don't adopt these technologies will fail in the next 10 years. So there's going to be a dramatic uh, path difference between those who do adopt and those who don't. And that plays a very large part uh, in what we do in terms of identifying investments for the disruptive um, global equity funds that we run. We're trying to find those winners, but we're equally trying to make sure we avoid the losers. So the future is now. Um, here are some areas where we're seeing it you know, actively implemented. In transportation, although we haven't yet got to the nirvana of autonomous driving, and it may take some time before we get there because there will be significant hurdles to overcome, not necessarily just from an intelligence point of view, um, but legally and logistically. You know, how will we handle auto insurance if the car is driving itself? How will we deal with the car making a decision in a um, fatal accident scenario about which fatality it's going to choose? There are all sorts of moral dilemmas that are going to have to be um, dealt with. But we are moving down the path towards electric vehicles and towards more and more autonomous driving, um, even if it's to the extent of just adding more and more intelligence into the car um, in order to assist our driving, to make us drive in a more safe fashion. I drive a Tesla, and it spends a lot of time telling me uh, when I'm at risk. It tells me when there are vehicles right up by the side of me. Uh, it warns me when maybe I haven't slowed down as fast as the car in front of me, and it gives me a warning so I can start to think about how I drive, and I drive probably better um, as a result. Um, in healthcare, there are significant opportunities for the use of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, a company, for example, like Intuitive Surgical, which makes general surgery robots, they have a huge installed um, community now globally, and they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of procedures in their data set. So when a surgeon goes to operate on a patient, um, they're able to draw on that enormous data set to assist them in a better outcome. Um, that is not possible um, uh, without this kind of network effect. So it's where Metcalfe's law, which you know, so obviously applies to a network like Facebook, can also apply to a network of machines. If that no network of machines can provide huge data sets, that can be used by uh, the humans using those machines or by the machines themselves even to generate better outcomes. And in healthcare, you know, outcome is the critical criteria. Uh, Hyper automation. Um, we're going to see a huge amount of increased robotic opportunity. Uh, farming is a great example. Um, there's a company in the United States called Trimble, which has an enormous amount of sensors uh, placed on all sorts of farming equipment and the ability to use the data from that to generate better outcomes for farming is, is clearly only a matter of time. And then the automation of knowledge work, which we spoke about in terms of replacing 
uh, human labour with machine labour. So uh, I think you know, the point really to make here is that AI really is here now. It's accelerating very rapidly. Um, it will continue to change the way we live and work, and it's something we need to be uh, you know, extremely conscious of, probably both from, from our own employment prospects, um, but also actually from, from deciding and helping our uh, children and our children's children to decide what they're going to do in life. You know, when I started work, it was the city or the legal profession was what everybody wanted to do. Well, both of those professions might be heavily challenged by artificial intelligence in the future. So, you know, when I'm talking to my children, we're talking about very different types of, of job opportunities. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Any questions for Mark? Yes, there's one here, sir. There's a, there's a microphone just there. Is it inevitable that artificial intelligence will replace human judgment? Um, I don't think it's inevitable. It's one of the really big moral um, dilemmas that, that, that the world is, is, is focusing on at the moment. And I think as, as I, there's a quote in one of these very first slides here um, from um, Sundar Pinchai, who's the um, CEO of um, Google. The AI is one of the most profound things we're working on in society. And it's profound not only because of its benefits, but also because of its potential dangers. Um, and so, you know, it will be interesting to see how things evolve in terms of uh, regulation and how artificial intelligence can be driven. We're quite a long way away from um, artificial intelligence being you know, clearly better than human intelligence. Um, the best guess at the moment is about 2050, maybe the sort of period, time frame in which that might start to look like it's the case. But we've had dates over many years, dates have been, con they're constantly being moved out. It's taking a lot longer to reach that point, that point of what's called singularity, where the machine is, is, is better than the human. But it is a, it's going to be a constant debate and it's going to become more and more important. And it's also extremely important in terms of dealing with things like security um, between countries. It's, it's no surprise to me that we've seen such a huge uh, increase in the tensions between the US and China, because China has the biggest data set in the world by a long way. They have twice the number of smartphone users of any other country in the world. They have more AI-powered apps than anybody else in the world. Yeah, maybe this is the cycle where they lead the world, and that scares a lot of people. So it's going to be constantly debated, I think. There's a question over in the far corner. Uh, well, first of all, I haven't said it's the ideal world. I said I think it's the way the world is evolving. I think there are pros and cons. Um, clearly, security is a risk, um, but I see it as something which evolves. Um, it's not going to be. There's not going to be a revolutionary um, security breach. I don't think. I think if we look at the physical world, of which we've got tens and hundreds of years of, of experience. Yeah, we get quite large security breaches, you know, like 9-11, for example, but we evolve from those. And I think we're seeing the same thing um, in, in, in a cyber sense. So as we see breaches, therefore cybersecurity develops to deal with those breaches. And so I think that it will be evolutionary. There will be breaches. There will be problems. They will get dealt with. Security will be improved. I think it's unlikely there will be one single event that has a sort of cataclysmic outcome. We've got another question in the far back row there. It was a great talk, but um, I guess I, I have personal interest in this. I, I work in this space. Um, we've been promised for 40 years that robots are going to take, us, uh, take over from us and, and make people redundant in about 20 years' time. Why is this different? So, so I think that's the point really I made, that there have been these kind of estimates about the point at which these technologies will um, drive that key point of change. Um, I think the reason, the reason th that it's different this time is primarily because of data. Frankly, until we had connecti device connectivity, if you go to 2006, so just before the smartphone era, at that point, we have 400 million connected PCs, wired, wired connected, wireline connected. 
We had some sensors, but they weren't connected in the same sort of way as they are today. Whereas because of the Moore's Law driver, we can now have significantly higher levels of connectivity, whether it be smartphones or whether it be sensor-type devices uh, or IoT devices. So that has driven this massive proliferation of data, and data is what's needed for AI to drive robots to do that replacement. So I think that's the key difference. Uh, one final question for you, Mark, over, over there. Uh, I see that blockchain, the uh, a panacea for everything, crept into one of your charts. Uh, what's your view on blockchain? Um, so I'm a huge fan of blockchain. Um, I actually, um, just over two years ago, I actually did a, an Oxford University um, course because I thought it was potentially so enormous. And blockchain is essentially the process, I, I, I say it's the process of automating trust on the one hand, and it's the process of um, uh, pushing computational capability away from single point sources and spreading it around on a distributed basis to make no one individual or no one organization as powerful as perhaps they are today. So for example, could you have Twitter or Facebook on the blockchain without having to have a company with a management that's actually driving the policy for that company. I think over time you can. But one of the key ways that blockchain will be used in the short term, I think, is for automating trust processes that we rely on at the moment. For example, if we buy a ticket for a concert or a sporting event, we buy it from a trusted counterparty. If, if if those tickets sat on the blockchain and therefore you didn't have to worry about their authenticity, then you could do that without that trust point. In banking, could you send money from one person to another, not through your bank, which you do at the moment because you trust your bank, but directly because it was done on the blockchain? So I think you can automate a huge amount of trust using blockchain, and that will be incorporated in many software products. Then the question, I guess, the follow-up question is, what does that then mean for cryptocurrency, which at the moment, I guess, is one of the biggest use cases for the blockchain. And my view there is that with all the money printing we've had in the last 18 months um, because of the pandemic, there is a clear case for, di for digital currency, and that currency will sit on the blockchain. I don't know whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's something else, but I think there will be a what you might call digital equivalent of gold, um, and so that will be a blockchain asset as well.